uh, we will just get started while you do the poll, then we'll go over uh, the poll answers and get into discussion. So um, I'm facilitating this session with Travis and we're both at ANA here. What, uh, what we're talking about today is how indigenous language serves as a protective factor. And what we wanna do is really hear from uh, you all who run native language programs and hear what um, your indigenous language is doing for your community other than just revitalizing the language. What other great things, uh, aspects of resilience are occurring in your community? The survey is not clickable. I, I, you know, I tried, um, oh, Michelle said she couldn't find the link, huh? I don't know, Travis, can you try and make it clickable? I don't know how to make it clickable. The link is in the chat. Okay, the link is in the chat. Let me stop sharing just briefly and see if I can stick in the link and get to- oh, There we go. It looks like it's clickable now. Okay, is it opening it? Oh yeah, the bottom yep. one's clickable now. Okay, has anybody been able to access it? Yeah, yeah Heather, I was. I was. But did it open for somebody? Yes. Yes. Thanks to Alaska TTA region for, um, or Alaska region TTA for making it clickable. Okay. <laughs> okay. Clickable. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. If, if you all just want to jump in there, I'll go back to sharing my screen now. Um, okay. So we want to talk about, you know, what do our languages do to protect us and to make us resilient in our communities? Um, so just a little background about ANA, because I know there's multiple organizations putting on this summit. So ANA, am I sharing my screen? Jeez, I think I wasn't sharing my screen. I'm sorry. Here we go. Okay, I'm back in action. Okay, so the Administration for Native Americans was established in 1974 with the Native American Programs Act. And we fund uh, federally and state recognized tribes, as well as Native Hawaiians, nonprofit, and um, our Pacific Islander relatives as well in American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So the mission of ANA is to promote self-sufficiency and cultural preservation. Uh, we give socioeconomic grants. We give environmental regulation grants, and then preservation and maintenance language grants. and. Um, the Esther Martinez Initiative Language Grants as well, and those just this year changed to five-year grants. Uh, so ANA's vision is to see Native communities thriving. So um, I'm going to introduce myself in Inupiaq since this is a language summit. So Pagla Givsi, Atiga Heather, Inupiaq Runa Alaskami. Uh, I'm Inupiaq, my name is Heather Soyak Jean Gordon, and I'm an enrolled member of the Nome Eskimo community, and I grew up in Homer, Alaska. I'm now a program analyst for ANA in the division of the program evaluation and planning. So if you have an ANA grant, we'll usually visit you towards the end of your grant to see how it went and how your objectives went and how your impact was in your community. I have a PhD from the, in Indigenous Studies from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I have a lot of experience working with indigenous people around self-determination and sustainability, a lot of qualitative research, uh, some new research on restorative justice and how language and culture are protective factors. My co-presenter is Travis and I'm gonna let him introduce himself. Tanshi the Nishkawash on Travis. Uh, my name is Travis and I'm a member of the uh, Métis Nation in Canada, specifically through the Manitoba Métis Federation, uh, though I grew up here in the States. Uh, I also recently joined ANA as a program analyst uh, working on impact evaluation after finishing my master's in public health and social work, uh, where my research mostly focused on violence prevention and looking at uh, issues like community violence as a system. So looking at the different causes and effects and the way that they interact with each other. And of course, one of those interactions, especially in indigenous communities, in our communities is uh, language and culture. And so I'm very interested as well to start looking at some of the ways that these cultural aspects help protect our communities against violence and other issues. So thank you. Can you re-stick in that link again, just in case someone new has joined our session and uh, 
their chat is blank. Definitely. Okay, everybody. So I'm, I'm, we had written a session abstract and I saw once the program got condensed, it was just reduced to a one liner. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about where we were coming from. So Travis and I are really interested in how language learning um, especially language revitalization programs, are serving as a source of resilience in communities, providing well-being through social, mental, physical well-being, uh, identity and belonging. We've read uh, the research out there where language has been linked to um, reduced rates of suicide ideation or um, reduced rates of diabetes or um, how it's been increased to a more connection in the in the community or um, and then there's the huge host of um, what's been passed around by mouth that you know it gets parents more involved with their children and that you know attendance um, goes up by youth or that their test scores even go up there's just not a lot of studies out there yet that say these things but we hear them all the time so that's why we're so excited to talk to you and hear about what your community has found um, so we're interested in you know how have, how has your community been thriving as a result of language learning and so what impacts beyond language revitalization have occurred in your community a lot of um, this conference is based around looking at that language revitalization and we want to look even one step further at those other impacts that are happening in your community. So I'm going to pop around with my screen a little bit here and try and get into SurveyMonkey to look at the poll results. And I will share my screen in just a second here. Okay. Let me figure out how to share this screen. Okay, so we, we have people joining us from, we've got 19 people who answered the poll. We have some people calling in from Europe today. We have some people from Alaska, Arizona, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Nebraska, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wisconsin and others. So we have a quite wide reach across the US right now um, and in even into Europe. So that's exciting. We're excited to hear all you have to share. Um, I keep going through the results. Let's see um, some different languages that are being taught. Okay, so we have Got all kinds of things popping up on my screen as the presenter here. We have the Ojibwe language. Um, we have German being taught to people coming from Africa. Also learning about a language that I'm going to pronounce terribly, I'm sure, Sequipemic from BC. You know what, let me just scroll through these and not try and butcher all of the pronunciations, but we have um, Athabascan languages, which is related to Diné and Navajo language. We've got Choctaw, Tiwa, Navajo, Lakota, another one doing Ojibwe, more Navajo and Tiwa, Conestoga, Wampanoag. Uh, we have a Yupik speaker with us and an Alutic language program. So we have quite a lot of different uh, experiences coming in today. So we've got some, um, a variety of language programs as well. We've got some language nests, some immersion schools, adult language learning, uh, some K through 12th grade after school programs, early childhood teacher training, and even more others. So we have a, a vast diversity of different types of programs represented today. Um, it looks like the most, uh, there are seven K through 12 grade language class um, programs are presented. And then have outcomes beyond language revitalization occurred in your community? We have some yes and we have some no, almost 50-50. We have 47% with yes, that's nine people and 10 people with a no. So we are so excited to hear um, from those yeses to help uh, us all figure out how to make that happen in our communities. So instead of getting into the comments in that one, I'm just going to jump um, to our next slide so that people can share um, about it to the group themselves instead of me just reading the comments. I just wanted to kind of see um, what kind of um, 
initial reactions we have. So we do have some people who have hopefully some good stories about how language revitalization is bringing some resilience to their communities. So I'm gonna let Travis introduce our discussion. Yeah, so thank you again, uh, everybody for coming in and really excited to dig into some of those poll responses and, and hear from you all. Um, so as we discussed today, we just ask that you would introduce yourself with your name, your tribal affiliation, if you're working with the language program, what the name of that program is, uh, who funded it and the target ages of that program, and then what kind of program. Um, so that's just some helpful information so that we all know uh, where we're working and what kind of work that we're doing as, as we have this discussion. Um, and as we discuss, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing answers from any of these three questions. Um, so the first one is really looking at what impacts or outcomes beyond language revitalization have happened in your community because of your language program. So have you noticed your language having impacts on different mental or physical health outcomes or having other kinds of uh, impacts in the community that might be a little more difficult to measure? What has happened that you'd like to share with us? Um, if you have seen some of those impacts happen, uh, we're really curious to see if you're measuring those. So what kind of uh, measurements are you conducting of those impacts outside of language in your language program, if you are? Um, and then finally, and this is maybe sort of the most niche question, but if you are seeing different outcomes or you're seeing different impacts, are you seeing different kinds of language programs having different impacts? For instance, are language nests having different uh, impacts than mentor apprentice relationships? Um, so those are the three main questions that we're looking at, but again, really just wanna open this up to the group and maybe we'll just start at that most broad level right now. And I'll just ask if anyone has seen uh, the, those people who answered yes, what were some of the things that you've noticed? And you should have the ability to unmute yourselves. I muted everybody off the bat, but you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Ghost. Let's see, na 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 na, na na eh, na eh, to be a na eh, see it no. Why you at na na auto yet na one? Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, my English name is uh, Ron Oldman. My Arapaho name is Goose, who flies first, and. Uh, I'm a Northern Arapaho. I, I guess I would just like to say that, you know, in the current situation of COVID-19 present in our area and on us and surging, um, we are having to teach virtually. I teach the Arapaho language in our school district, K through 12. So I'm one of the yeses in the survey monkey. And, um, but anyway, I, I see, a positive impact of being able to teach virtually is, and we not only teach our um, Northern Arapaho tribal language, but we're also speaking, we're also beginning to teach them uh, Plains Indian Sign Language. So, and uh, we're exposing not only the students to, to these, uh, to this form of speaking, but also it's exposing their parents and other family members into revitalizing and, and sustaining our Arapaho language as well as uh, learning the Plains Indian Sign Language. Uh, currently, we have no way to, out to measure the impacts. Um, we are a state-funded school, so that's where our funding is coming from we 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 have um we don't have any grants so that we can uh track the impacts or what, whatever we're doing here and um i i just see we got we got to look positively on everything that's in in a negative situation now and i see that virtual teaching is really a huge positive for instructing our students in our language 
I won't, I won't take up any more time. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. And so it sounded like you were saying that that um, the virtual teaching is actually helping to bring in parents and family members who you might not have really been able to to communicate with much uh, when everybody was coming into school when the students were actually coming into the school. Is that right? That's correct. I, I'm sorry. I, I thought I had my video on a while ago, and I apologize for that. I turned my video on and turned my put myself on mute. But that's correct. Um, once, once before COVID nineteen, we were we were in, we were teaching our students, but there are very few speakers in the homes mm -hmm. of our people today, and I think that's the case in in every native. Um, Native community, Native um, tribes, yeah. tribal nations. Definitely. I love your background, by the way. Oh, thank you. That's my that's my Arapaho name. I see that. Yeah. It's great. I, I'd be curious for other folks who are, you know, maybe doing distance learning or virtual learning. Have you seen similar effects that, that Ron was telling us about? Uh, what is that looking like for your communities? Yacht A. Yacht A. My English name is uh, Elvin Keyswood. I am Diné from the uh, Four Corners, New Mexico, within their Diné nation that's guarded by our four sacred mountains. Now, Kadenana said, Che, Aro Tapa Hadashanale Aro Kwe Yahadi Kut Ae Asani Tlini E Bahaja Do Hashit Ae in that Nakin, Janosin that Nakin Kizan Lini Shi Art Kobe Artke Janosin Beko in that Nakin Oko Ay, you see here. Again, I just want to thank all of you uh, for being here. And myself, I teach at a middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders here in Shiprock, New Mexico, at Seventh Ott Middle School. And I do, just like uh, Mr. <clears throat> the gentleman uh, before us, that we do teach virtual and we do online classes. And it is a good thing that we're doing it online. It brings the family element together. My class is oral language. So we we have very little reading, very little writing, more talking and understanding. So, and like Mr. Oman was talking earlier is that the family element, the family unit that I encourage and we encourage here on our Diné Nation is to get together and, and continue talking and really continue talking, not just at a short amount of time, just not for school, but continue using the language on a daily basis. Uh, our elders are really uh, influence our young people and it trickles down from, you know, the elders to the parents and then, and then to the children themselves. So with this virtual learning for myself and my class, I really encourage all the family members to participate. And even though, you know, it's for the student, it's still very viable for the whole family to, to pick up words and to say just small uh, phrases and then eventually build on and on and on uh, on that. So with that, you know, we talked about how this is affecting the community and, for myself and for my little community here in Shiprock, New Mexico, it seems like it's drawn more of the family unit together. And we have parent-teacher conferences where very few show, but with this online and virtual, we see like, they're all there. And like tomorrow we have our parent-teacher conference and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how many families do participate. I've been writing down numbers and time slots of when they can get in. So uh, for myself, you know, as an as a as a grandfather, 
paternal and maternal grandfather, I taught my children our language and their language. Now, of course, it's expected of my children to teach their children. And that's how we, you know, like all tribes, all of us do expect that, that our voice, our tradition, our language, our prayers, our songs continue uh, forever. So I just want to put that out just a real quick, short, and I want to take all the time up. So uh, may you all walk in beauty. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you, uh, Mr. Keyswood. I have had the chance to go down to the Diné Nation, and it's a beautiful nation with a beautiful language, wonderful people. So always appreciate hearing from you guys. Um, I, you know, I, I thought that was really interesting what you mentioned about how the parent-teacher conferences, you're more likely to get parent involvement in the language classes um, and sort of seeing maybe more involved parents uh, in these families where the language is being taught. Uh, and I'd be curious if other folks have, have seen similar things. I saw some nodding in some of the other chat heads here. So have we had anyone else kind of notice any changes in families or, or kind of improvements in parent involvement as a result of this kind of language teaching? Struggling to unmute yourself, you can just let Travis and I know in the chat and we can try and unmute you as well. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is Jeff. I'm a Dene from Kayenta, Arizona, which is close to the Four Corners. And I'm a K-8 teacher for Dene Studies. I uh, just want to say about my language program, since we did virtual learning, uh, it seemed like we, uh, the students weren't focused because my program consists a lot of conversational speaker. It seemed like at this moment, uh, we're missing out because they need me as a model speaker to teach the language. And uh, at the same time, they're losing interest. So uh, we're having a, a attendance problem. We have low attendance and that of students don't have the, uh, the, the tools to stay online for me to teach them. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the, the, the interest is not there through virtual learning. That's my thought. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's that's definitely difficult, and I'm sure there's lots of people on this call who could uh, sympathize with that challenge. Um, Scott, I think uh, I think we have you up next. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Or yeah, there we go. Great. Hey, <clears throat> Uh, greetings, may it be well with you. Uh, I introduce myself in my uh, language, Conestoga. I am Conestoga. I am Deer Clan. Uh, this is a standard greeting for us when we meet another Conestoga so that we know who each other is. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, in, in answer to uh, the, the introduction questions, uh, we are not federally recognized. We are not state recognized. Uh, we are not able to be recognized by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania does not recognize uh, Indian people. Uh, and I use that with term with trepidation at the moment. Uh, <coughs> out of respect to the covenant chain with the Haudenosaunee and, and those who are enrolled recognized, whether it be federal or state. Uh, we are thought to be extinct, which 
is not the case. Our, our last quote unquote known village was burned in 1763 in December of that year. And uh, everybody ended up being killed. It was the Conestoga massacre at Conestoga Manor in what is now Lancaster uh, County, Pennsylvania. This uh, opportunity, which has been presented to me through ILI and through all of you, I thank you for that. Our program is called Conestoga Language and Culture Authority. Currently, I fund Conestoga Language and Culture Authority myself. Uh, we have no federal funding right now. We have no state funding. Uh, We do primarily right now uh, development of materials. I created a coherent and consistent writing system from being based on the Cherokee syllabary because we are an Ir Iroquoian speaking people as well. And so I credit uh, Sequoia for the origins of our writing. And, and I, I give tribute to him and, and the enrolled Cherokee. I also speak Cherokee and I speak Seneca. My dad's mother taught me Conestoga, Seneca and Cherokee. Um, the program is educational and uh, the effects that I have seen from conducting work within our own speaker community is an increase in happiness uh, a, a, a decrease in depression, a decrease in anxiety, a decrease in isolation, a decrease in self-hatred, and a decrease in shame. When I showed the writing system to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm very emotional, to English is not my first language either, so. It's okay. Uh, when I showed the writing system to an elder speaker, they said, this works. And they had internalized a lot of shame about who they were. And that has been reduced. And I've been able to go to them as a resource on ideas for curriculum development. Uh, and that has, I think, in my observation, caused a change in them and how they value our language, how they value themselves. The way, and I have talked to other elders as much as I can, and they say, do what you can. We are pragmatic uh, because we have had to hide for so long. When we get to know somebody, we take them under our confidence once we can trust them. And we, we share with them our language. The elders have told me, teach teach our language to the foreigners. And uh, so I do. And uh, so the impacts and outcomes beyond the language revitalization occurring within our younger generation and, and the older generation uh, and in, in my generation is it seems that our, our confidence is increasing, our, our taking pride in ourselves is increasing. Our internal connection seems to be increasing. We were at the precipice of that being lost entirely. Uh, and if we don't do something now, it will probably be lost in 50 years in any case. Uh, so we're, we're at about the end of our rope here. And um, the differences in the way instruction is being conducted that affects these outcomes. Uh, having a writing, coherent writing system now, I'll show you a book, just one moment, I'm sorry. Can you see? Uh, it's, it's, oh, oh. There we go. A little tricky. I think your background wants to recognize your face, but it doesn't want to recognize the book as a face. Okay, I apologize. Um, it's called A Vocabulary of Susquehannock by Thomas Companius Holm. It's by American Language Reprints to Evolution Publishing. If people are interested in exploring what is out there thus far, it is a list of about 100 vocabulary terms. I have been able to reclaim 
uh, from being fluent in the language. It's one of my first languages. Uh, and being in a community where I find people repeatedly who speak it, uh, that I've been able to recover material from there. And the reason I bring up the writing system is because a Swede recorded it. And so I had to learn some Swedish pronunciation to try and monkey with how to pronounce things and pass it with what I was hearing in, in my speaker community. And it worked. And I've been able to recover pre pronominal prefixes and infixes uh, and, and things that can be both pre pronominal prefixes and infixes. Uh, so very, very important grammar. And the impact has been being able to write down and show in, in uh, ink on paper, I cannot record it on a computer yet, I have to write it. What we are saying, and this was a changing experience for me, and it was a changing experience for the community because the community can now see itself visually. Uh, the Cherokee syllabary and our syllabary are very visual. And so it's, it's fascinating to be able to see yourself in those images uh, without being arrogant or, or something uh, of that nature. It's, it, it, it's neat to be able to see that for the first time in about 2,500 years. We have uh, a word that means uh, we, I write with pictures. And uh, on the Susquehanna, originally Susquehanna, it means river that is beautiful in our language. Hanna is an Algonquian affix. That means river and then ok, which means people. Uh, and in our language, Susquehanna is river that is beautiful. And the, the picture writing means something and it's ours. And unfortunately, it's been degraded by dams further down the river. Um, the, the, the beautiful thing is that I can share this with you. I thank you for the time to share, for all the encouraging comments from, from the people in the chat. Uh, I will put our contact information for Conestoga Language and Culture Authority in the chat. If you would like to contact me there, I would be very pleased to speak with anybody and uh, humbly ask for any appropriate help that may be given and and sent our direction. Would do. Thank you. Yeah, miigwech and thank you, Scott. That's a, a powerful story, and it looks like it's definitely resonated with a lot of people here. Um, let me see. I think we had somebody else. Uh, yeah, Bertha uh, Elk River. If you wanted to share, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, Shiat Esh, Bertha Elk River, and Shia, the lady Kaya Hita um, my name, or they call me Bertha Elk River. I'm from the Four Corners area, five, literally five miles from the actual Four Corners where Department of Indian Education, I teach uh, pre-K through eighth grade. From the blabbers to the know-it-alls, I always say. <laughs> and um, the one thing that there's pros and cons to this, um, the impact of the, our language programs the 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 pro is of course yes parents are finally seeing and hearing what we're actually teaching in schools the language and from what i've experienced is the parents are actually saying oh okay so that's what it's called or that's what it means like yat ain't the word yat e it um it, like in the earlier session with Peter McDonald, he said, Yat eh. So he translated it to good day. So that's what it actually means. It doesn't say hello. There's no word for hello in our language. So they they finally learning. And um, those are the pros. The parents are learning along with the students. And they're interested, they're actually seeing what we usually do in classrooms. But the, the, the con side is 
because of limited resource, which means technology, uh, living on reservation, no service here, no service there, one phone to a family. It's kind of hard to get to a lot of these um, kids. And mostly they're, they're um, um, battling over one phone because one student has to be in this class at this time and then the other student. So I gave them a block every uh, once a week and I just go through the lesson and I trust them to do their work. So I had one parent, out of, I would say one out of 25 that expressed that their, their um, main core the academic core, the reading, the math, and they were more important than the language. That kind of hurt me. It really did hurt me. And within our schools, our expectation is we have to be accountable as teachers. How do we account for what is being rejected by, you know, a, a, a parent? Because we're, the language is not that important. That's why in our, with the BIE, we give grade, uh, the language is a mandated, um, um, uh, mandated curriculum with the letter grade. So I'm glad that's, that's one of the pros there. So it, it's, it's, it works both ways, but the bottom line that I tell the parents is, I'm glad we're doing this. Yes, it is a virus that's among us and but it's, te it, it's allowing us to do a cultural and traditional teaching, which is listening first. Because when you're born, the first sense is listening. So you hear it first and then you see it. So that's what we've, uh, I've been teaching them. Give me a call once a week. We can chat on the phone, give you the lesson. Then... Once you finish your work, show me. And that's that's what we we um that's how I've been trying to work it. It's frustrating, but then again, um the how do you say it? The 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 parents when they realize, oh, so this is what you do, that aha moments that they share with me, that's more rewarding, you know, than the one out of 25 parents that says, you know what, I don't have time for the language. So there, there is uh, pros and cons. And the other, the other thing I wanted to share was because of the language that we use more at home, we use, it's kind of like in a uh, disciplinary act, disciplinary. If you, if you um, know something um, how should I say it? My doorbell rang and it just focused that way. Um, the, just like the, um, how should I say it? I, I don't know, I'm just blanked. But anyways, what we teach is what they're um, using every day at home because it's real life, it's real life, uh, real life stuff. Like right now I'm teaching the younger kids uh, the sounds. And this week's lesson was the eh sound. Eh, yes, kla, kla, the be, the be is mutton stew, I tell them that. Yes, kla is you put on your shoes, you put on your socks before you put on your shoes. Yes, kla first, uh, do kla, you know. That's, that's um, because they wear shoes, they wear socks, they eat mutton stew, they, you know, um, um, I just use their every day and the parents kind of laugh at it and I have to remind the parents, please don't laugh at it. And they say, no, it's just cute, you know, but um, I tell them to encourage them and I do have a lot of uh, feedback from the parents that are saying it's a good thing you know, now I see what you're actually, you know, sharing with our kids. And I've had grandparents this morning thank me. Thank you very much. We had no help. Now I know what you do. 
so anyways, that's my, my, uh, the outcome, the impacts of the, the revitalization that we're trying to do. Um, but we just need to continue to support one another. Just like uh, Scott had said, we, we all need help. How do I, you know, and this, this summit is really helping me because I've seen and heard some things. So, but that's what I wanted to share. So thank you, um, all of you. Appreciate it. Hakona. Yado ahiha. Miigwech. Um, I think we had Mildred up next, and just wanted to a quick shout out. I know that you guys, uh, brother, you guys have been hit hard with everything going on, and I know all of our communities have. Um, so just just wanted to appreciate the resilience that you guys are demonstrating and being able to keep up the work that you're doing. It's it's not easy, but. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of really incredible work being done and a lot of great adaptations. So just wanted to, to say that, but um, yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead, Mildred. Thank you for allowing me to talk. I'm Mildred Young, also part of the Marine from South Southern New Mexico. I am employed by a dual school, Cal State School. And in the last school year, I was teaching our native language to third, fourth, and fifth graders. And now that we're doing social teaching, I got thrown kindergarten through sixth grade classes. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, 30 minutes, I teach um, kindergarten through third grade virtually. Um, Monday afternoons, 30 minutes, I teach sixth grade. Um, Tuesday afternoon, 30 minutes, I teach uh, 4th and 5th grade. And in addition to that, I have two special ed students assigned to me. Like three days a week, I have four students assigned to me for the after school tutoring program. So in the whole day, I'm super busy, but I put in as much as language as I can into my communicating with the students. And the special ed students and tutoring after school, I address them by their native names as well. And what I wanted to show you is, um, since I have so many classes now, what I chose to teach is using simple books. We have friends in here in English, but the rest of the book, I have the English words covered. And I use to them in our language, what's going on in the picture, what are some of the items in the picture. And I encourage the students to uh, show me their pronunciation virtually while I have them in view. And that's also part of my assessment is if I see them find pronunciation words, then I give them a one, two, or three, depends on their uh, participation. And in this book, I'll tell them uh, friends is Fuyenema, but it's Fuyena for just one friend. And I'm teaching them that uh, how to say sentences also, like, for example, one of my students is Kuyutu Fuyu. So I say, on Fuyena Kuyutu Fuyu. So what I do is I do a lot of um, addressing myself in the first person sense and then show the book in, in the English. But sometimes when I already am through the class, like halfway through, then I'll cover the friends part and I'll ask them how to say friends again, like how many friends, one friend, two or more friends. And that's what I've been doing every single day. Um, Sometimes I get asked to sub, so I have to cancel my language classes, cancel my um, special ed time with the students, for, uh, cancel my tutoring classes after school. Uh, so I'm kind of like going day by day. Sometimes I see students parents in the background, and I see that they're sitting there listening to my teaching their child and they participate too. But there are some new parents that 
you can see him walking around in the background and uh, our teachers know for a fact he can speak in our community and he can't. And every day I cross my fingers in hopes that those young parents sit there and listen to me and try the language too because I tell the children your mouth and your mouth muscles know your language then it's much easier for you. It's a big difference if you just sit there listening and you don't move your mouth. So a lot of the students are trying that technique and they're trying their own sentences and I can hear them in the background and they're saying their classmate is their friend. Another book that I have, I teach simple, really simple books. Um, I'll just show you real quick what I've used. I've used the French book where I cross out the English. Let's eat. Meet my family. And we have specific terms uh, for each member of our family and extended relatives. And one of the things that I share in our culture, in our community, is when we're addressing an elder, we never use their name in our community anyway. It's just, uh, respectful to use a title like auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, big brother, big sister, little sister, big little, uh, big sister. Um, and this one, my dog, really, how would you say your dog's name? So I tell them, um, and my dog's name is not really, his name is Tommy, and I tell the students, Tommy means little snow. So I teach children, how would you tell one person? How would you tell two people? How would you address three or more people? Um, it's complicated, but I go just one day at a time, one book at a time. And when I see students out in um, public that I have already taught, they come before this pandemic, they would come to me and ask me, Messi, Messi, because Messi means teacher. They would ask me, can you teach me a sentence? I can practice that today. And this is this, little, this young woman is like over 21, still, still see me and come to me everywhere um, that she can. And that's how I open my door to my students. Is I definitely don't be afraid to ask me questions because as some of our elders, they have that knowledge not uh, locked up the language. And with me, I'm willing to share with all my community members because that's our culture. Language yeah. and culture in one. And our religion uses our language. So we need to teach these children our languages. Um, it is important that parents take part. Because before we went virtually, and I had these students in class, they would go home and have no one to practice with. So now that they see that it's virtually done, some of those parents actually sit in there, and I feel so good about teaching them too. So that's what I wanted to share, that um, our language is still being used, even if a little bit. Um, I'm reaching out to as many children as I can. It's a little hard virtually because some of our children here didn't have internet until about a week ago. And I was using the phone. I used up my phone uh, big time to try to reach out to them, and I did. And slowly they're coming into their virtual class, which I'm proud to have them, and I welcome them. I address them by their native names every time they come into class. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, just a couple, we only have actually a few more minutes, unfortunately. Um, so we'll have a couple more people. Uh, if we could just keep, uh, just just maybe just brief comments for these last two, uh, unfortunately, since we're supposed to end the session at five, but I do wanna say um, that we're gonna share our contact information at the end here. So if there's something else that you wanted to say or, or something that you thought would be interesting to hear, uh, we'd love to hear it um, and, and we'll provide some ways that you can reach out to us. Um, so thank you so much, Mildred, and, and uh, please go ahead, Lorraine, and then uh, Nina will go after that. And I think we'll, we'll close out after, after Nina. 
Well, I will say, Travis, um, I can stay on a bit longer and my Zoom call sure. went longer yesterday and they keep recording. So um, if oh, perfect yep. needs to drop off, please do. But if you do want to share share your story, um, I, we can stay on a bit longer. Great. I'll be here, too. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Heather. Uh, go ahead, Lorraine. Oh, you're on. Sorry, Lorraine, you're muted there. If you just. There we go. I got it. Okay. Anis Katz now, so Uza, her daughter cut at Hutz and Sadan's let in the Fairbanks list. Um, I live, uh, my name is Lorraine David. I'm from a small village, Hughes, Alaska, on the Quaker River in interior Alaska but I live in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, my job is to teach three to five-year-olds the NACA. We got a Department of Education grant uh, in 2016, a NAM grant. And so this is our fourth year of the classroom, but of course this year it's all virtual. Um, it was very hard to start this project because there are so many different Athabascan dialects here in Fairbanks and other languages, other Alaskan languages also, not just Athabascan. Um, but that was the only language I knew when I got offered the job. So that's what I'm teaching is Central Koyukon Athabascan, which is called the Napa. Uh, this year we're all virtual. Um, there's pros and cons to that. We connect with families via Zoom mostly. Um, the good thing about that is that the parents are now involved because they have to be. Uh, my teachers and I record, do little uh, recording, less than one minute recordings every week in the NACA to send to each of our students. And then um, we send them culture kits uh, every other week for two, for two weeks. And um, then we go through the not so good thing about that is that we can only meet with each student once a week. Sometimes we combine two students, but we found that if we try to teach all 14 students at one on a Zoom meeting, they're three to five years old, we can't uh, keep their attention. So we meet individually, uh, me and my two teachers with each student every week, um, trying to teach them the Napa. So just that once a week contact with each student limits their, the ability for them to learn. We try to share as many resources with the parents as possible via videos, recordings, um, newsletter, uh, e-books, um, you know, we have uh, thanks to uh, the evaluator of my project, Barbara. Uh, we have um, two e-books so far that are done. Uh, one's, the last one that's just about done is clothing. Uh, we did an animals one. So um, we try to reach out as much as we can the community, since this project has started, has started and I noticed that more younger uh, parents are getting involved because of their students that are in our class. Uh, they're, they're getting more interested in learning uh, their language, culture, and tradition, which is good. Um, few people have, we've had language nests here and there. Uh, Susan Pascavan does a lot of work for YKSD here for uh, rural students. Um, and so the language is being revitalized, but it's always a slow process. It never goes as fast as we want it to, but um, the interest is picking up in our community. So that's a good thing. And Abassi. It's great to hear. Good to hear that the interest is picking up and hope that that continues for you and, and everybody else who's on the call here. Uh, Nina, if you'd like to, please go ahead. 
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Gonna try to put my video on. We can see you. White Hochaitep. I'm the one calling from Europe, actually. So just to let you know, it's uh, going on to 11 o'clock at night at my time overnight. And just to introduce myself, I'm born German, uh, grew up in five different European languages. And some 30 years ago, I was taken in by Elder Evelyn Camille from the Kamloops Ustashi Khwatmuk nation, uh, Kamloops as her daughter from across the ocean. So I'm maybe one of the few people who grew up born European, but halfway raised in a, in a native society as well, native community. And uh, what I would like to share actually is that um, when I first came over there, it was at the time when they started first uh, building up the university programs for native people, First Nation studies, and uh, with the aim of having also campuses reachable and uh, yeah, available for native people. So they built up a campus in Kamloops, BC, and I was the first international ex exchange student over there. And it, from there on, it started that uh, I started learning the language over there and um, gave an impact on that way because at that time, due to residential school and the impacts most of the people had given up of maintaining the language. And suddenly this uh, foreign German girl came along and started learning the sounds, started learning, yeah, how to express herself. And it gave a major impact at that time where people were just saying, well, if, if that foreign girl knows how to do it, we can do it too. So people came up and started getting into it again, definitely. And then the communities were facing exactly the problem which has been mentioned a few times already through these days, that suddenly you have an elder generation being fluent, a younger generation trying to learn and a middle generation who does not have the language anymore. And how do you breach that gap between the generations basically? Because in the schools that languages were starting getting taught again, but then the kids were coming home and at home, nobody was able to speak it. And um, that is, I think, still a major problem. But the one thing what I wanted to share is, uh, and that's something I've been really thinking about for the last 30, more than 30 years, is that European languages work on a completely different grammatical structure than Native American languages work. And what the elders taught me is that when I started learning the language over there and asked questions where they said, well, the way you ask your questions, we can't even answer them because there's no way in our language to, to answer it in that way you ask them. I don't know if I'm making myself understood, but it's, it's this whole way of how uh, a grammar, a way of talking reflects your whole way of realizing, of thinking, of conceiving the universe, the entire world, it works in completely different ways. For, for instance, as far as I know, like the European languages are very much focused on, on time uh, sequences in the verbs, for instance. While as far as I know, Native American languages are more focused on how information is passed on, how the networking, how the living together is expressed through the language. <laughs> And I think that's a major um, important thing to, when, when language programs and especially revitali revitalization programs are built up, is not to have them based on European way of how to teach languages, but uh, really to develop for each individual language their own way of, of passing on this, this inherent intrinsic knowledge of, of how language is related to the places, to environment, to every living being basically, which is something which European languages have lost. So yeah, it's, it's just an encouragement. And um, I mean, I, I, I'm so honored to have been, have been able to be part of this conference these last three days. And it's awesome work all everybody I've been hearing is doing and just uh, want to give you a major, major encouragement to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nina. It's a great story. I appreciated hearing it. Um, 
And so I'll, I'll ask if we have any any kind of final comments or any other responses to the questions, any thoughts that this discussion has spurred up so far. Um, hey, Tra Travis. Yes, Michelle. I just wanted to ask um, if Lorraine could share why she thinks the interest in language learning um, has picked up, because she mentioned that um, at the end of her comment. But I really wanted to hear more about why um, cause I think that could get to the question of, you know, people's yeah. value of it, like, you know, beyond just learning it, what, what is, what, what's driving that interest? Yeah, that's a great question, Michelle. I don't know if Lorraine, if you have a response um, to that. Or... I believe, I believe it's because, um, that more the younger generation the parents that we have are younger uh, and their children are in our program. So of course, parents do what they can for their younger children, you know? So, um, and now that we're in remote learning, they have to be involved. Like we send the recordings, we say, you need to practice this before next week with your children and then I noticed too, there's my two teachers and I are on Zoom with them at their lesson, the child's lesson, and then the younger siblings are there and the parent is there learning with their children. And they say they enjoy listening to that the knock on the videos and the little skits that we do. So I think that's how we can or connecting more with the younger generation is through their kids so that's why that's great thank you i'm loving the very supportive comments we're seeing in the chat by the way that's great to see yeah wonderful um it, does anyone else have anything else they want to share um any other types of resilience they've seen come out of their language programs, uh, whether during COVID or before COVID, um, or... Um, oh, yeah, we've got Clarissa uh, would like oh, to share. awesome, thank you. Go ahead, Clarissa. Hi, I'm from the Isleta de Su Pueblo from El Paso, Texas. And I just wanna agree with everybody on on the effects of COVID and doing virtual online. It is hard with my program, we struggle because we have, I think when we were in school, we had more parent involvement, but as of right now, as we're doing Google Classrooms, our, enroll, our involvement with the parents is becoming less and less. And they, we do send out skits as well and our language through videos for and to show the kids not to forget their culture, their traditions. But the parents, they struggle with the thought that people are going to make fun of them, are going to be judged the way they talk. And we're, I clearly put it in the video, do not be discouraged on talking. We're all here to learn together. And I think my coworkers can agree too that it's been really tough with the parent involvement like really really tough yeah and i know i've only been working with our pre-k program for about six years now and i barely got back into my language i stopped for about five years i grew up with the language of traditions culture but i moved away to arizona and i forgot about my culture and I, when I came back, it was a culture shock to me. And I was like, how could I forget this? Like, this is, this is my heart. This is what I want to do. So looking at my grandparents teaching me again, and then elders from our community showing us the language and telling us too not to be discouraged. We're our next generation that needs to be, that needs to show the, the future generations of what, what they're, I say this <laughs> like to be proud of who they are and where they come from yeah so that's that's my passion about working with the kids 
I love hearing them greeting me in Tiwa, saying Hinokopuyu teacher, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I'm like so excited. And then every morning we used to start with a morning prayer, which was uh, the boys would chant and the girls would dance in a circle around our carpet, and I miss that. That's that's what would make our day every day. We told the kids, this is how we start our day. This is for us to have a good day. So they were always excited to hear the beat of the drum, the girls dancing, and it was just, it was just an awesome experience. I just wanted to share about what we do in our program as well. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's great to hear. And I hope that you're able to get back to those dances and prayers soon. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity. Um, we actually have a question for you, Clarissa. Um, Mildred wants to know how you say, uh, how are you in your language? Well, that one, I'm still kind of learning the language, but I believe it's Hino Watawe. Hino Watawe. Hino Watawe. That's great. Then, Thank you. you know, what are you doing as well as Hino Watawe? So there's always, that's always the mix up with me. <laughs> <laughs> It's a subtle distinction. Thanks for sharing that. Appreciate that. Uh, and I think we see, yeah. And see, another share, uh, Susan. Susan, yeah. And then I guess there's in the chat, uh, Mildred was hoping to get your email, Clarissa, as well. Okay, yesterday I did a presentation. Um, unfortunately, my Zoom wasn't working. I couldn't share my screen. But um, one thing that came out of COVID, uh, we started having meetings at our, I work in the district office, I teach Denaga. Um, and one thing that came out of it is we were able, had time to collaborate with our staff in Fairbanks, but then also with our um, teachers in the villages. And uh, we ended up creating a workbook. I can't see myself, so I'm not too sure you can see we can this. see you yeah okay okay great um and so i was uh we made this workbook and gosh i don't think i changed my video so it has a background i think i'm oh i know what i'll do uh anyway um we made this workbook and with it it has games for um students uh, that they can play and so that went to each of our households and um, having time downtime then that helped uh, my staff and I to there's only two of us <laughs> to create a lot of online resources and so um, I shared that yesterday and um, I'll put my email in here if anybody wants a copy of that pdf it will be put up on the uh, summit webpage with a link and then I shared the resources that we discovered since COVID um, and we didn't do a survey of the families you know if they had used the materials but I know on social media um, some families had posted that they were playing games with the students and it helped to have the resources so that uh, the students could continue to stay in Danaga Bassi. Thanks for sharing. Uh, did we have anybody else who, who wanted to share or hadn't had the chance or heard something they wanted to respond to? Any questions either for us or for the rest of the people uh, who you've heard from here today? I can then I can jump into um, if you are interested in applying to an ANA grant, we do have training and technical assistance. Um, there's four different offices based on the region you're in. Um, so I put up the contact information for those. Um, we just finished our grant cycle and awarded grants uh, just very recently for the 2020 cycle, but the 2021 grant should be coming out um, in the spring, February, March, um, something like that. And um, I know there's, uh, if you contact the regions, you can get on a listserv as well to be getting information from there. Um, Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, I think, oh, there we go, Eastern. Thank you everybody for helping out. 
And then we just want to say Koyana. Uh, Travis wants to say Miigwech. And thank you so much. And we put um, our contact information at the bottom, Travis and I, if you're interested in contacting us about anything, um, we can connect you maybe with different people at ANA that can help you out as well. And thank you so much. And uh, the closing session is at 530. If you'd like to join, just go back through the, um, the um, uh, what's it called? The, the agenda page. There we go. The TTA just posted the agenda page. And so you can just click that link and get in there and we'll see you again. Thank you so much for participating with us. Goodbye, everybody.